Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, welcome to lecture five uh, and week four on thermoelectricity from atoms to systems. Uh, today I'm going to talk about ballistic uh, thermionic coolers and nonlinear Peltier devices and some of the system consideration for that. In uh, uh, week two uh, in lecture four, Professor Landstrom introduced a thermionic device and when the barrier is very small, um, you have a Peltier cooling and Peltier heating due to this uh, thermionic emission and uh, there is no joule heating in the device and you saw how the parameters of the device, the transport parameters change when you move from a diffusive uh, barrier to a, um, a thermionic barrier. Um, one of the things I want to discuss is that if the barrier is very, very narrow, uh, even though ideally you can define a cooler, in practice uh, it's not very useful. Why? Because uh, cooling happens only at distances of, of on the order of maybe 20, 50, 100 nanometer away from the heating, and we never have a perfect heat sink on the other side. So the heating cancels the cooling and you don't see anything. Contrary to transistors and information processing devices for coolers, size, uh, making them just smaller and smaller does not um, necessarily help because of the heat sinking problem uh, that we have and this is something we emphasize. Uh, in a practical device, if we have such a barrier, we need to make it on a substrate and the thermal resistance from the hot side of this barrier to the uh, heat sink and to the ambient is not negligible. So this affects significantly how this device performs. In practice, is, as I said, for devices with very tiny barriers, the optimum currents are uh, hundreds of kiloamp per centimeter square. You cannot heat sink them well on the substrate. So we need to deal with them with a slightly thicker one. Still, the ballistic effect could be important. Um, so the question is how we can analyze that. In a paper in 98, um, uh, we looked at the joule heating inside the barrier when the barrier is, uh, in this case, 3 micron thick. And uh, in, we had 5,000 electrons injected in a barrier of gallium arsenide um, with an electric feed of 5 kilovolt per centimeter. And the initial barrier was about uh, 0.1 electron volt. That's the thermionic barrier. When electrons are injected uh, from here to the barrier, you have evaporative cooling of electrons and then you get cooling here. But here we are interested what happens in the barrier. Electrons, energy deposited by electrons in kilovolt per centimeter, reaches equilibrium, that's what we call joule heating, but it requires a distance on the order of a micron. And this uh, can be fitted with an exponential curve, so the energy and the um, the, uh, the distance over which uh, this transition happens is called energy relaxation length. So the joule heating locally can be approximated by I times V divided by D. This is the joule heating, but one minus exponential give us this uh, solid curve. Uh, basically, not much joule heating happens near the emission because electrons, they don't have time to relax. So they're first emitted, they go straight before they can relax and scatter and so on. And at the beginning, you don't have as much um, uh, joule heating, and this is included here. Once you do Monte Carlo, you can actually learn quite a bit about electrons. You can see where the energy of the electrons uh, is deposited. So the major energy relaxation mechanism uh, in a 3.5, uh, in particular in this case gallium arsenide, the red uh, dots are the data from previous graph, and here are the major contributors to this energy relaxation, uh, energy deposition by electrons. The most uh, significant part, these two components, are uh, the uh, polar optical phonon emission and absorption in the gamma valley. Gallium arsenide have electrons in the gamma valley and the high electric field they could also go to the L valley. Polar optical phonon emission and absorption uh, uh, take energy from electron and give some energy to electron. The net balance is of course energy loss and is given by the red curve here. The other uh, scattering mechanism, significant one, are the polar optical absorption and emission in the L valley and the 
LL valley, multi inter valley scattering because there are not a single L valley, there are multiple one and electrons can scatter from one to the other and you can see where this scattering happens. Um, so here is the graph that shows um, the electric field dependence of the uh, energy relaxation length. So the energy relaxation length we defined in the previous graph depends on applied electric field. And interestingly, it has an up, uh, kind of a maximum value. As you increase the electric field, electrons go longer and longer distances before they can deposit their energy. But then when the electric field is a lot, the distances over which they relax is become shorter and shorter. And this comes from an interplay between polar optical phonon scattering and intervalley scattering. Um, basically, this decay comes because electrons have enough energy to do intervalley scattering. But they give us an idea that the energy relaxation length for gallium arsenide, for example, is on the order of uh, 300 nanometers, 3000 angstrom. And uh, that is a distance over which uh, the electrons go ballistically before they give their energy to the lattice. How this will affect Joule heating. If I have a device and I send current uh, from emitter to the collector, there is cooling on one side and heating on the other. And we, uh, in addition to the Peltier cooling and heating, you have Joule heating. Because of this ballistic component of heat, not half of the heat comes to the hot side, half to the cold side. That's what happens in a diffusive regime. Fraction of the Joule heating coming back to the emitter, to the cathode, depends on the ratio of the thickness of the device to the energy relaxation length. If this energy relaxation length is, um, the device thickness is much more than the energy relaxation length, that means this is diffusive, this curve uh, saturates at a value of 0.5. That's what you learned uh, in the lecture with uh, Professor Lundstrom. But if the device is thinner on the order of couple of energy relaxation length, this factor goes down exponentially. It could be a tenth of the joule heating coming back to the cold side is even lower. Here is an analytical equation which was derived in this paper and you can um, you will look into that as a part of your homework problems. Uh, it's actually quite instructive uh, to derive this. So when you consider the system impacts of the, the uh, this type of uh, thin film barriers, uh, you need to consider non-ideality on the hot side and you need to consider non-uniform joule heating in the barrier. Now let me uh, shift gears and look at another uh, uh, example that happens in uh, thin film uh, devices. Um, here is called nonlinear Peltier coefficient. Peltier coefficient is a transport coefficient that relates the amount of energy transported by electron gas to uh, the amount of charge they uh, transport. Uh, and typically is a material property independent of current. Here, a calculation done for indium gallium arsenide um, is a material with a ZT of about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 at about 800 Kelvin. Uh, by adding some nanoparticles in uh, week five, you will see that the ZT can be 1.3 to 1.5. So it could be a good thermoelectric material. Here is the calculated Peltier coefficient which is a millivolt, which is Seebeck coefficient times temperature as a function of current density at different dopings. When the doping is high, 10 to the 18, this is a coefficient independent on doping and that's what we expect. Uh, but if uh, the doping is a small, 10 to the 17 and 10 to the 16, uh, with currents on the order of 100 to 200, a kilo amp per centimeter square, we can increase the Peltier coefficient significantly. So if, and these are results from Monte Carlo, and it was fitted with an analytical equation. So the Peltier coefficient has a form that's come from the Fermi energy KT. This is coming from the uh, regular band structure, but there is a component of it that depends on current. And this current dependence is what is given on linearity. Uh, it's current square because of the symmetry argument. It cannot be current because it shouldn't change with direction of current. And it depends on the relaxation length, energy relaxation length, and the total momentum relaxation length. This comes really from the heat capacity of the electron gas. So Peltier coefficient can increase significantly with bias, especially at low temperatures. Um, so that's some of the effect that happen in thin films. Um, another way to look at it is 
to monitor what is the local CBE coefficient in a uh, small barrier device. So here we have a small CBE coefficient contact, small CBE coefficient contact. In between them, we have a larger CBE coefficient low doped semiconductor. Uh, when we send current, we can monitor the amount of heat current uh, transported by electron and divided by the electrical current and temperature. The ratio, it's really like a local uh, uh, Seebeck coefficient and in the small Seebeck material, in this case Seebeck is 200 um, and in the high Seebeck coefficient, the local Seebeck uh, can vary from uh, 270 to around 370 depending on the bias. So a couple of things uh, that this graph uh, teaches us is that Electrons start moving in a material with a small Seebeck coefficient, it could be a contact. They actually gain energy in the contact before they enter the barrier. This is the reason for Peltier cooling. So the amount of Peltier cooling is the area on this, this curve or proportional to that area. So that all of the Peltier cooling actually happen in the contact, not inside the thermoelectric material. And similarly, you have a Peltier heating on the other side. Um, inside the material, as electrons move, they lose their energy. Uh, but how much they lose their energy changes with bias. Why? Because at higher biases, electrons in the low Seebeck coefficient material um, are heated up and they don't have yet time to relax so their average energy goes up. So that's exactly what we saw before and now you can see it locally. Can this be useful? Well, if you take a one micron thick indium gallium arsenide and you put it between a heat sink and a heat source, Based on standard um, linear transport theory at this doping, which is optimum at 77 Kelvin, the device should cool uh, maybe less than uh, a degree or so uh, with this type of current densities. But because of um, nonlinearity of the uh, Seebeck coefficient, the cooling uh, could be significantly more, and this shape of cooling versus current uh, comes from the uh, current dependence of the Seebeck. Of course, now by now you have learned from a system component that this is extremely hard to, uh, to observe. Why? Because we assume a perfect heatsink. You can always do that in a theory, but in experiment, uh, after a micron barrier, it's very hard to, to, to put something with perfect heat sinking. Even if you put a metal like gold or copper, uh, the thermal resistance of that cannot be neglected. So these are um, things that you can learn from the theory. In practice, it's hard to, to observe nonlinearity. Um, Often the question is, if you have a nonlinear Peltier effect, can you also have a nonlinear Seebeck effect? With the same Monte Carlo, you can calculate the Seebeck coefficient of an electron gas under different temperature gradients. And at low temperature gradients, this is what you expect from a linear transport theory. At high temperature gradients, these numbers are really high, more than four to six Kelvin per nanometer, the Seebeck coefficient could go up slightly. This effect is actually much less than uh, the nonlinearity in the Peltier. Uh, and even thinking about temperature gradient of couple of degree across nanometer could, uh, could be a, a, a problem because how could you even define if you are such a non-equilibrium case? Um, uh, so that's actually questionable. Um, so some, but the question is why is it is so hard to get nonlinearity of the Seebeck while we saw nonlinearity of Peltier from our room temperature or linear transport experience? We think that the two should be directly related. If we look at the transport equations, um, the direct, the electrical current is proportional to the electric field by the conductivity and the temperature gradient by the, uh, uh, the Seebeck coefficient. And the heat current is proportional to the electric field by the Peltier coefficient and uh, temperature gradient by the electronic contribution by thermal conductivity. In the linear transport theory, um, it can be shown that Seebeck and Peltier are related because they have the same order um, of, uh, with respect to the electric field and temperature. Um, so this is uh, something that is not the case when you talk about nonlinearity. Nonlinearity with respect to temperature, uh, higher order nonlinearity, is not the same as nonlinearity with respect to current, so the coefficient of Seebeck and Peltier cannot be directly related the same way. 
Uh, let me finalize it with the, the last point I want to mention is what happened inside a, 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 a diode, what happened for the case of minority carrier thermoelectrics. Uh, this is the N and P leg, famous N P legs of a thermoelectric model, uh, current flows uh, from N to P and goes out. Typically, heat sink is in the bottom and the cooling can happen on the top as a refrigerator. Electrons follow a direction opposite to the current and holes follow a direction in the same direction as the current. If we plot this in a band diagram, this is how it looks like. Um, electrons are basically uh, current flows from this electrode to this electrode. Basically, electrons go from a metal to a semiconductor, n-type semiconductor. They cool because of this uh, Peltier effect. And on the other side, they heat. In the other direction, instead of electrons, we need to look at holes. Again, there is cooling and heating. As a result, the center region cools down, and that's what happens here, and all the heating happens near the heat sink. That's a standard double leg thermoelectrics. It's interesting, if you remove this metal in between, this is a PN junction, and what is the thermoelectric effect inside a PN junction? First of all, um, in a PN junction, you cannot apply a current in this direction, uh, basically going from N to P, because that's uh, in the diode case where um, the diode doesn't conduct. You need to send um, current um, uh, uh, in the case, uh, you, you need to forward bias it, so you need to send electrons uh, from the N side to the P and holes from the P side uh, to the N. When you do that, then for each of the subpopulations, you have cooling and heating. So electrons have a cooling and ever their energy, average energy goes up, another cooling here, uh, and then electrons have heating here, and then the cooling happens for holes in the reverse direction. Electrons are majority carriers here in the n-type material, but they are minority carriers in the p-type, so this is what is called minority carrier Peltier effect, but you see that there is cooling that happens near the p-n junction. This is something that one could use. In a later paper uh, with Kevin Pipe, these calculations are injection current internally cooled uh, light emitter, um, you have again the p-n junction, you apply a bias, forward bias, electrons are injected in the active region, holes are injected in the active region, they recombine, that's an LED, you can get a light out of it or make a laser out of it, but if there is a tiny barrier so that in the electron population that is in here, only the hot ones are emitted. And in the whole population that is here, only the hot ones are emitted in the uh, active region. The recombination happened between the hot electrons and hot holes, um, hot electrons and hot holes, and you can have net cooling here. These calculations were done for the case of gallium antimonide, gallium indium arsenide antimonide that can have this type of type 2 staggered band structure, and uh, typically you have joule heating in the layers and contacts. Conventionally, you have a little active cooling, uh, cooling in the active region by uh, designing these barriers to be optimum, you can get a couple of hundred watt per centimeter square in this uh, what is called injection current internally cooled light emitter uh, icicle. These are theoretical um, uh, calculations. Uh, to do this experimentally, again, the challenge is to get these current densities and uh, uh, kind of avoid all of the contact uh, joule heating problems and so on. But there have been a very nice experiment uh, recently in 2012 where they show similar ideas is used uh, to have an LED with an efficiency more than one. Typically, LEDs that emit at uh, near IR wavelengths 2 to 2.5 micron have very low efficiency. This is the optical output versus electrical input power. The efficiency you can see at the uh, high powers is less than 1% one plug efficiency, uh, even approaches 0.01%. Uh, but as you make the LED hotter and hotter, uh, at higher um, currents, uh, the device doesn't perform as well, but at low currents, you get more power than you would get at lower temperatures. And at certain very low currents, your efficiency could be more than 100%. That seems to be violating you know, energy conservation, but 
but uh, in reality no because in this case you are taking the energy from the heat from the stage and converting it to the light as a result your efficiency is higher than 100 percent of course the values are very low but that shows in principle how uh, this uh, electrothermal energy conversion could be used to improve uh, optoelectronic devices let me summarize this lecture. Um, we considered system uh, uh, kind of limitations for thin film, thermionic coolers, uh, uh, and um, we also discussed about nonlinear Peltier and uh, bipolar uh, Peltier effects. Uh, and finally, uh, we discussed that internal cooling um, uh, could be used uh, to, uh, uh, to make the junction in a PN junction cooler than the surrounding, and also to improve the efficiency of light emitting uh, devices. Um, in the next lecture, we will summarize uh, uh, what we learned in week four in all of the system uh, consideration. Look forward to see you in lecture uh, six.